You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagon Yedele and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Body Banter. I, my name is Claudia Krebs, and I'm joining you from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, also known as Vancouver, Canada. And I'm joined by my co-host, Shagan. Hi, how are you? Hi, Claudia. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shagan Yedele, and usually I am situated in Kelowna which is the traditional ancestral territories of the Silk Okanagan nations. Uh, but I am also joining you from Vancouver today. And today we have a guest. Um, and I would like Tara to introduce herself. Hello, Tara. Hi, my name is Tara Gertner. I'm a second year resident in psychiatry at the University of British Columbia. And I don't know if you want me to say more about my background. I have a background, I guess, in neuroscience and music uh, before studying medicine. And I spent uh, many years studying neuroscience and doing research. And then also after that, many years uh, teaching music to young children. So that's where my interests in music and the brain have come from. Tara, it's so wonderful to have you here on the podcast. We met when you were a medical student. Um, mm -hmm in the neuroanatomy labs and of course you had been teaching other neuroanatomy labs in the program so we've known each other for quite a while um mm -hmm. and you came to me to do a flex project at the time which was to continue work on your book which is all about the developing brain and the impact on of music on that developing brain so music and children exactly your background right like those years of teaching young children and then uh, your neuroscience background combined now with your medical background and psychiatry i find your story is so um beautiful and compelling tell us a little bit more about your pathway and how you landed where you are now sure i've definitely taken sort of a winding path in my career. So I started out studying uh, neuroscience. I did a PhD in neuroscience at the University of Texas in Houston. And then I moved to Vancouver um, to take a postdoctoral position at UBC. And um, at that time, I had uh, a two-year-old who, who was born while I was in grad school. And um, I remember thinking that I was studying, you know, neuroplasticity, studying how the brain changes and develops in the lab. And then I'd come home and get to see that happening in real life in, 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 uh, you know, in my, in my daughter's head as she was like discovering the world and learning how to do things and exploring. And of course we did a lot of music together because it's one of my passions. Um, and then in the end, I decided to, I had another child and decided to leave research um, so that I could spend more time with my children. And that was a perfect choice for me. And at the same time, I became interested in teaching music because my daughter, I noticed as two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old, was loved music but couldn't sing in tune and couldn't keep a beat. And I thought, well, is that normal or is there something wrong with my child and and then what you know how do i fix this you know or will she just you know learn it at, as she gets older and so all of these things together i started teaching music and started learning about how music develops in in children and that led me to be interested in music and the brain and what's happening in in children's brain as they learn music and then i've continued teaching music more and more children and and like all of those kids, I could see their their development as musicians and made me question more and more what was happening inside their heads as they learned all those things. And there's so many aspects to learning music. There's rhythm, there's pitch, there's motor control, especially in young children. There are so many changes in motor control that happen over, you know, the 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 years that they're learning music. I was teaching kids who are three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and the changes in motor control over those years are, are dramatic. Um, 
So yeah, so it was wonderful for me to be able to combine those interests. And then as I was learning more about this and giving talks to other music teachers, I started writing about it. And I started a blog called Training the Musical Brain, which um, is still available. It's trainingthemusicalbrain.com, although I haven't added to it in many years because at a certain point I decided to go back to school and I went to medical school. And then I was very busy and didn't have time for, <laughs> for adding more to my blog. Um, but yeah, it, that's, that sounds really fascinating, Tara. And, uh, and maybe you'll help us settle some controversies today <laughs> in terms of whether, whether we can train a non-musical person uh, to become musical um, and what part of the brain does that. But I wanted to go back a little bit to to your story um obviously we we have an audience that's that's diverse some may have some knowledge of music and some may have knowledge of just anatomy or neuroanatomy um and there is this right brain left brain um um dichotomy that we talk about where as you would know the left brain is the part as you were saying that you teach young children to be able to their motor functions and so on and you would think perhaps okay so maybe that's located in the left brain and the more aesthetic and the more appreciation of music the more nuance uh, uh, understanding of music would perhaps be right brain is that still does that still hold or 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 not well the, the sort of right brain left brain question is is an interesting one so um, there's a number of different ways to answer this. So in general, I think you can say for most people that appreciation of music happens more on the right side of the brain than on the left. Um, although in, in everybody, the right and the left sides of the brain are talking to each other all the time through the corpus callosum. Um, but, but certainly when they look at activation of brain when listening to music, that the right side is more activated and people in general. Um, however, in musicians, it actually, the activations tend to are more equalized between the two sides of the brain so that musicians tend to use their left brain as much as their right brain um, when they're analyzing or listening to or responding to music. And then certainly the oh, motor control. I'm sorry, sorry, go uh, ahead. To jump in there because I find that fascinating. I would have thought that the bilateral activation in musicians would be while they're producing music, but you're saying that's while they're listening to music and appreciating music. So a musician has a completely different way of analyzing and sort of appreciating the sound from a lay person. What, what, why, why is that? Yeah. I mean, to me, that makes sense that, you know, when a somebody who does not musically trained hears music, they, I mean, I guess I would say that they're just listening to music and they're hearing it, but they're not doing any kind of like analytical processing of music in a sort of a cognitive way. Whereas somebody who's more trained in music might be listening and thinking, oh, now it's going to a five chord and then that's going to resolve. Oh, it actually didn't resolve. It went to a six. Like, so maybe analyzing the harmony or, or understanding that the rhythm is in three, four rather than four, four that, you know, so different kinds of meters. And so there's more cognitive comprehension of what's happening in the music for somebody who's musically trained than somebody who's not. That's one aspect of it. Um, so I guess that the, um, the, the, it activates, music activates more parts of the brain in somebody who has training because there's a deeper understanding of what's happening during the music. Yeah, I can totally understand that in the sense that it trained, not because I'm particularly great at music myself but because I, I i watch a lot of music shows um and you would hear things like oh this person was my inspiration or this particular music and when i listened to it I, I thought oh i could do this with it oh i could change it this way and i could so that totally makes sense to me that when musicians um hear sound and hear music they're actively thinking and manipulating that that sound and and working with it to see how they can perhaps improve it or change it or customize it for their own use so that's that's really important now in terms of those who do not have that uh, uh, training who are not musicians um is there like a uh, i'm thinking of like a threshold at which they are able to 
uh, I guess, understand, use, appreciate music? Uh, you know, is there like, because you've, you've said you've done that with little children, teaching them music. Is, is there a threshold where you say, oh, by this age, if you're not, if you don't get it, you won't ever get it? Or, or does that plasticity remain throughout life? What do you think? So certainly I think there's, anybody can learn music at any age. Um, but like with learning languages, the brain is more plastic at certain ages. And, and there seems to be a critical period for music learning where if you start learning music before the age of seven, it becomes easier. It's easier, easier to learn. And, and if we look at the brains of people who start musical training before seven, we see differences that are not present in people who began their musical training after the age of seven. I mean, it's not a strict cutoff, obviously, but, but it's around that age. For instance, we see, um, uh, more development in the corpus callosum that coordinates the two sides of the brain um, in people who began their musical training younger and then changes in the auditory cortex as well. And that doesn't mean that if you start your musical training when you're 10, you can't be a professional musician. It doesn't mean that if you start mu your musical training when you're 40 or 70, that you can't learn. It just means that there's advantages to starting younger. That's really, really cool. And um, so when you look at that neuroplasticity, which of course we know the younger the brain is, the more neuroplasticity you have, what are sort of the downstream effects on those uh, children? So if a child starts sort of, I don't know, with basic music lessons with drumming and, you know, making sounds on a xylophone and whatnot and uh, learning the basic principles of singing and, and all of that. And let's say starting at four, how does that change those brains? I'm trying to remember the exact changes, like the physical changes that they can see. There, there's some studies that have uh, looked at structural changes in the brains. And some of them are a little bit of a chicken and egg question that if you take, you know, professional musicians and you look at their brains, you can see that they're different um, from, from people who are not musicians, but then the question is, well, are they professional musicians because their brains are structured in such a way to give them those extra strengths in, in the skills that they need. But there's been other studies that have looked at, um, that have taken young children and given them like three years of music lessons and done, done um, MRI scans before and after, and then looked to see compared with a control group that got, you know, uh, I forget what the control group was like dance classes or some other, some other class, but not the classes. Um, and they have seen that there's increased connections within the corpus callosum and changes in the auditory cortex. And I'm afraid I'm blanking on what the other connection, the other changes were. There were, there were a couple of other things, but I think those were the biggest ones. Um, and then that seems to correlate with, um, uh, with an ability to, to, to recognize pitch better in, in, in children who have that younger training. And I, I always feel like that I can use that as a bit of an excuse that my, I always feel like my weakness as a musician is that my ear is not very good. I'm like, just like that fine grain tuning is not, is not what I would want it to be. And I didn't start my musical training until I was 10. So that's why, I mean, I think there's a genetic component there too, but which we could also talk about, but, but that, I think that early musical training is, uh, it's an advantage. That's that's so um, fascinating to to hear. So I'm wondering about people who we would say are gifted. So I actually have two questions. One is about people who would say we would say are gifted musically, um, because you said chicken and maybe it's a chicken and egg type situation. And I'm wondering wondering whether such people have been studied. I don't know whether that, I know there's some anecdotes about the brain of Mozart or the brain of Beethoven being, having been studied, I don't know about, but in terms of if any particular peer reviewed study has been done to actually study the brain of say, musically gifted people to, uh, to wonder wh where are those, where are those differences, if any, uh, from, from the general uh, population. And yeah. 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 I don't know if there's been any, any studies specifically of the brain of, of, of kids who are really, really musically gifted. There's certainly 
there's a field of research that look that are looking at child prodigies and seeing what's different with them. Um, but I know, for example, one of the things that's often looked at is the development of perfect pitch or absolute pitch, which is um, it's a skill that um, some people seem to have where they can hear a note played on the piano or, or on the violin or whatever instrument, and they can just name the note. And most people don't have that skill. Um, that's It's not something that you can necessarily learn. It's, it seems to be one of these skills that either you have it or you don't. It's sort of this dichotomous trait. Um, and then when they look at the brains of people who have perfect pitch or absolute pitch, as it tends to be called in, in the research field, um, people with absolute pitch um, tend have there's differences in connectivity in their brain in inside the temporal lobe where the the air the auditory cortex text, the pitch areas of the auditory cortex are more connected to parts of the temporal lobe that are involved in naming things. So there's definitely brain differences in those in people who have that skill versus those who don't. But prodigies, I'm not sure, to be perfectly honest, if there's any anatomical differences that they've seen. There's a right. lot of different skill sets that go into making somebody a good musician. I see. And, and my, my second question would be in terms, and, and I correct me whether there's any um, study also about languages, um, whether about people who are musically gifted and their ability to learn languages. Um, just from my own anecdotal, um, I was actually watching a YouTube video this morning about somebody, a very famous person who can speak, I don't know, five different languages and also is like a classical pianist, you know? And I'm wondering, is there like a link between ability to learn languages and, and, and musical talent? Yeah, that's a good question. And I'm not sure that I know the answer to that. Um, there, I mean, there's been a lot of research that's been done on language learning and music learning and how they use overlapping parts of the brain. So I would expect there to be a correlation between people who find language learning to be easy and people who find music learning to be easy. But I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Off the top of my head, I don't know what the research is in that field. That's really interesting. I remember a language school that used a lot of uh, music to open, they called it opening people's ears um, to the different sounds of different languages. Um, so that was sort of their approach. I have no idea if that was rooted in any evidence or if it was just kind of their way of recruiting people who would pay for their programs. <laughs> but right. um, that was uh, sort of an interesting approach there. So when we're looking at the plasticity of the brain and the influence of music, um, what do you think is like the biggest impact of music on the human brain? Hmm. I mean, there's a number of different ways to answer that. But I mean, I think that for most people, the most, the, the the most important thing that music does for us is its emotional effect that most people listen to music because it makes them feel good and it makes them feel different emotions. And, um, and I think that that's its strongest effect when you look at, I mean, I, I don't think there's been any studies that have done that have tried to like quantitate what parts of the brain are most activated when we're listening to music. But I think that if you look at people's, interest in music and why they do it it's that emotional component and their love for music that that's the has that's where the strongest impact is yeah and when we look at sort of human societies and human evolution music has been with us from the very beginning so it seems to be something that we're attracted to right it seems to be something for our emotional well-being, for communication, for bonding, for a sense of identity, a sense of community, all of those things sort of play in there. And I mean, everything I've described is a huge part of frontal lobe function, right? So, uh, which is, of course, extraordinarily large in humans. So I wonder if that's sort of a co-evolution there with our love for music and our us being drawn towards music um, and the evolution of our frontal lobe. What do you think? Yeah, that's interesting. I've never really thought about it in those terms um, because we tend to think of the emotional parts of our brain as being sort of lower level limbic system that are like less 
recently evolved, but certainly, um, you know, other animals have those parts of the brains and they don't necessarily get the same type of enjoyment from music that we do. Um, there's a lot of theories about um, the evolution of music or its its use in our societies, as like as you were saying, as part of a bonding experience. And so there's a lot of research going on that looks at how making music um, in groups and, and moving to music in synchrony is a way of increasing bonding and how that um, brings groups together. And I think that, that that in that way, music has a very important role in our society now and, and could be harnessed to help people who feel like they're lacking in community. And I think that's many people. So working in psychiatry now, I'm seeing lots of people who feel disconnected um, from the world who don't feel like they have a community that they're connected to. And I think that, um, that so I'm starting to do some research that are lo looking at the, the benefits of group singing for people. Um, and I think that there's a lot of promise there that you can get people to sing together in a choir. And that gives, it gives this kind of group cohesion in a way that other activities don't necessarily do. That's absolutely fantastic. I mean, really wonderful to hear. I have a colleague uh, when I used to work in South Africa and uh, she um, specializes or specialized in music, music therapy, where she uses music, um, you know, and, and being a psychiatrist, I, I'm really curious about your, your opinion about that. But she uses music um, usually about, she works with children with a mental disability and and she has some fascinating results where she's able to calm calm children um she's able to you know and she's a very very good pianist as well and 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 just affect behavior you know by just you know the music she plays and so i'm really curious i mean based on what you just said about music being used to kind of modify group <laughs> group behavior maybe it works at the individual level as well. Uh, do you have any opinion about that? Well, definitely. There's a lot of evidence for music therapy, especially in, um, I think, calming people or in activating people, depending on the type of music that's used and the type of activity that's used. I mean, if you can think back to sort of like the the maybe more sort of primitive or basic uses of music, like the lullaby, for example, you know, like it's been, you know, many, you know, thousands of years kind of thing that people are singing lullabies to their babies to calm them and to get them to, to sleep. Um, and so that's music therapy builds on those same sort of primitive uh, ways of using music. And certainly we see that there, there are studies that have looked at the effects of music listening on, on people and they can see that if that calming music tends to decrease heart rate, decrease breathing rate, decrease cortisol levels, and that's just music listening. And those studies raise a lot of interesting questions about, you know, you can't necessarily say music listening in general will always decrease heart rate because it depends on the type of music. So those studies are difficult to do because they involve a lot of sort of subjective evaluations of what music to pick when you're doing those things. And, and um, different studies might use slightly different music and then get slightly different results. But in general, calming music is going to lead to those sort of calming effects on the body. There's so much bias in this as well. I remember a study that they did on rodents where they exposed one group of rodents, I think, to Metallica or, and, you know, what was termed as disruptive heavy metal or whatever, and then one group to like soothing Mozart music. I mean, there's non-soothing Mozart, but they took, took the soothing Mozart um, and then they found differences. But then it turns out they treated the rats completely differently as well. And so <laughs> because they had a bit of an agenda, I guess, to uh, discredit the heavy metal music. I don't know if you heard about that study, but I, not that one in particular. I mean, I, there was a study I read recently where they took rats and stressed them. They they subjected them to this chronic stress protocol and then played them. They half of them the rats got Mozart. Or it might have been mice. I can't remember, but but the ones that listened to the Mozart did not show the same kind of anxiety behaviors that the 
the ones that didn't have the music did. And I thought, well, that's super interesting. I wonder what's going on there. There was no um, talk about mechanism in that paper. Like, why, how is the music um, causing these effects? But I, I also thought, well, I'd like to see this replicated before I put too much weight on it. And yeah, do you have a new opinion about white noise? Uh, just because I, I have friends that swear off white noise that that's, um, and I actually, you know, if people close to me use that with their kids to kind of put them to sleep or, or you know, calm them and so on. And I'm wondering, what's the mechanism of that? How does just, just noise, really not noise, but, you know, just like continuous hum, like a humming sound in the background is able to, um, to affect people, help them sleep and so on. You know, that's not strictly speaking, that's not music, but you know, do you have any opinion about that? I, well, yeah, it's interesting because it's not, that's not music, but it has this, it's ha, has some features that overlap with music in that it's like an auditory stimulus, right? So it's activating our auditory system. Um, and I've, I've heard mixed things about white noise or about hum, like that some people find it soothing, but that other people can find white noise quite distracting because you can hear patterns sometimes in the white noise and people can find that quite disturbing. So I think that as with many things, there's indiv individual differences in our responses to, to different stimuli, which makes it hard to study. Absolutely. And it, I think it also goes to uh, sort of the point that we're really good at looking for patterns and finding patterns, even if they're not supposed to be there. Um, so, and I think some brains are probably more in tune with detecting patterns. And so for them, maybe those white noises are just a challenge. Like how can I detect what's happening there? Yeah, I think the studies have shown that people um, who are neurodivergent are more likely to be finding patterns in the white noise. That totally makes sense to me. There's yeah. been a body of research looking at sort of the emotional effect on certain frequencies of sound. Uh, so famously, low frequencies of sound um, can have sort of a, um, a saddening, depressing effect on people. Um, and mythology has it. And I, this is a rumor I've heard over and over again. And I haven't been able to find sort of concrete evidence for it. But when they were building the huge organs in cathedrals, they would put in a huge pipe that would um, emit a sound just below the threshold for hearing for humans. But the sound would still be perceived and it would make people feel a sense of humility, awe, and kind of like, oh, it's like, a, and it would be played um, during the ceremony or during mass at like sacred moments. Um, and I'm not, again, this is more in the realm of mythology. This is a story that I keep on hearing. Um, and I, I've looked, but I haven't found evidence that this actually happened. So if any of our listeners knows about this, I would love to hear more about it because I find that really interesting. Tell us more about the effect of um, frequencies um, on, on emotion and on our well-being. Well, I mean, I just want to respond to your story first, because I think, you know, when we hear really low frequencies, I mean, or if they're just below what we could hear, I imagine we would feel the vibrations of that instead of, of hearing it through our ears. So it would be more of a bodily sensation. And I think that's true for all low sounds that we tend to hear. I mean, we, we hear music through our bodies as well as through our ears, right? And that's especially true for low sounds. So I wonder if that's part of, of what's happening with lower frequencies and, and its effects on our emotion. I don't know a lot about the, the research that's been done on different frequencies, but certainly I know that that pitch is one of the things that factors into when we're listening to a piece of music, whether we think it's a happy song or a sad song, our, our perception of emotion in that piece, pitch is one of the factors that we look at. So things that are, um, that are very low, and I'm thinking, you know, like funeral, you know, funeral marches kind of thing tend to be in low pitches, and then little sort of chirpy high things tend to sound happy. Um, and that's, I, I don't know how much of that is socialized that that we learn that low sounds are sad sounds and high sounds are happy sounds versus 
whether or not that's an innate thing. So I know some aspects of, of music across cultures, these things tend to be the same. Like for instance, fast music tends to sound either happy or angry, and then slow music is more sad or calming. And that's true across cultures. And that they've done some studies where they take music from, from different cultures and play them to people who are not familiar with that type of music. And people can recognize what the what emotion was is being expressed in that music, even though it's not a type of music they're familiar with. So I suspect that the pitch aspects are the same, that they're, they're true across cultures. And so then there's something sort of innate in how we listen to music that, um, that allows us to, to make those sort of emotional determinations. That's Absolutely. so cool. Sorry, I was just thinking, sorry, shaking all the, um, with the low sounds, as you were talking, I was wondering if it's associated like with things like the roll of thunder, which would signal danger, right? Like to, you know, in, in our evolutionary past, when we'd have to really go and seek shelter at that point, you might feel that roll of thunder before you can really hear it. And that um, gives us that sense of urgency and dread that we need to find safety. Whereas... High pitched bird singing is usually the world is okay. There's no predators around. The birds are out there singing. Maybe that's a happy um, sound of safety. I don't know. I was just wondering about that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Although you, it's always hard to guess where where these things come from, think, how things evolved in a certain all way. We, all we need is a time machine. Go back thirty thousand years, forty thousand years. Do a little experiment, and then we know. Tara, that's Sounds what it's going to do. do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's so good. Um, just kind of rounding up on on this now. We, we um, just I'm going to give you a, a little heads up because we like to ask our guests about their favorite body part. Since this is body banter, uh, we like to ask you know our guests to tell us in their experience, in their learning, in their research, or in, as a personal preference do they have a personal uh, a favorite body part but uh, i just wanted to comment a little bit on the pitch uh, uh discussion that we're having because i watch a lot of sports and part of sports is the national anthems and it's fascinating to me how between east east mediterranean and and asian countries their anthems are completely different to say western countries versus Latin American countries that are a lot high pitched and fast and very, you know, um rallying kind of music. And 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 you're you're right. There must be, there's something to that in terms of how social um the just the socially learned uh, parts of just our of life contribute to those different uh, ty types of music that that different nations um hold up as symbolizing their nationhood and their national character. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, certainly every, you know, while there are some similarities for sure in terms of, of music across countries, in terms of what aspects of music portray different emotions, there's obviously huge differences in, in kind of the character of the music of, of each different country of the different cultures. Um, but certainly the, this kind of anthem idea of music, that's one of the, the sort of characteristic uses of music is to, to provide a song that pulls everybody together, right? So a song, something that people can be proud of and feel that represents their, their group. Um, I guess it's similar to when people used to be like, you know, going into war, they were, the trumpets would play the war song or there would be a war chant. And so it's that same way of bonding people together. Well, that's what you were saying earlier, right? How um, the singing together can give us that sense of connection and community. And that goes to your research project as well, where you're taking folks who feel disconnected and putting them into an environment where they sing together. I used to sing in a choir and I still have really, well, very emotional memories of how beautiful it is to stand together and uh, create beautiful music with our voices. And that, that critical moment when, you know, the altos, the sopranos, the tenors, the basses, all singing different notes and they all merge together into one experience. Um, it's, 
it's beautiful. I mean, there's, you know, like when you, and I mean, you have the same, of course, in an orchestra, um, but there's something about making the sound just with your voice that is quite transcendent. Yeah, I agree. Because I've been thinking about this. I play in an orchestra these days. I play in an orchestra called the Vancouver Pops, and there's uh, there's an orchestra and choir. And so sometimes we play with the with the choir, and and I think that singing in a choir is gives a different social experience than playing in an orchestra. Because I have certainly sung in choirs in the past as well, and I can see that even within this one group, which tends to have you know, people, the orchestra and the choir tend to have people who are sort of similar demographics, similar ages, similar interests in music, but the choir, they seem really bonded and very sociable amongst each other and the orchestra, not quite so much. And I think it has to do with that idea of everybody singing in unison, whereas an orchestra, there are lots of different parts going on at once. We're all kind of doing different things. It all fits together, but it's all different music. Whereas in the choir, they tend to be singing much more, even though they're singing notes, they, they're making the same movements and the same the same words at the same time. So there's that synchrony is, is there a lot more compared to in an orchestra. So that I'd love to study that. That's so interesting. And I think another aspect could be that in an orchestra, um, it's you through your instrument making music, whereas in a choir, it's just you, right? Like yeah. you through your voice. So it's much more direct. Um, like when I'm playing my instrument, I'm kind of struggling with the strings and my finger position and reading the music while also contributing to something. Whereas with singing, it's much more direct. But I'm not very good at my instrument. So that there's that. I think if you're very good, then the instrument just becomes an extension of yourself. And that might be. A much more visceral experience for those folks. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's probably true. Cause as you were saying, I was thinking, I think mo most of the time when I'm playing, I feel like I, I'm not struggling. I mean, there's like hard bits in my music that, that I struggle with and I'm thinking about what my fingers are doing, but a lot of the time it feels like I, it feels like I'm singing through my instrument. Of course, because you're very good at what you're doing. Right. And I think that's true for all professional musicians. It becomes an extension. Yeah. So Okay, that's just a me problem, not a universal problem. Well, I think it's not it's not entirely a you problem. Definitely there's I think for every musician, every orchestral musician, there's parts where we're working really hard. But I think that's probably true with singing as well. That that that's you, true. Yeah. your instrument is your voice and there's parts where you're struggling with with getting the right notes and getting it to sound the way you want. That's true. Right. You two musicians need to Give us a break. <laughs> um, it's one and a quarter musician at most here. <laughs> <laughs> I guess what I'm learning uh, from you, Tara, is that there's there's lots of good that music um, has done and is able to do um, with with people um, in terms of teaching them. I guess uh, community, um, helping people uh, develop some skills that they probably did, didn't know they had and um and and you know just building social cohesion uh, i guess uh that music has been used to do and perhaps is still being used to do uh, but also in the fact that there's so much more to learn that there's so much research that's still possible uh, about um some of the questions that we've raised today the, the parts of the brain involved um, the plasticity question, uh, the different types of music, um, and, and actually designing an experiment that will really be, be actually come up to the standard of peer review um, might be is really challenging when it comes to music. Um, mm -hmm. So if there's a lot yeah. to consider. Yeah, yes. certainly. When I started studying this field of music and the brain, I guess almost 20 years ago now, I really started diving into it. And it seemed at that point, like, this is kind of like a manageable field. There's a bunch of different questions, but it's, you know, I, I could read about everything in this field. And then in the last 20 years, it's exploded. There's so much research going on now. It's fascinating, but I find it hard to keep up with everything for sure. Well, I'm glad that the field is exploding because I think it's such an important thing to study um, because of all the beneficial effects of music that we're seeing. And I really look forward to hearing more about your study um, in, uh, in your patients who are struggling with um, psychiatric illness and who may hopefully benefit from these interventions, which seem 
um, low barrier uh, as opposed to you know a lot of other interventions that we um, may have to do in in patients with mental illness. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of promise here. So, coming back to my question, Tara, <laughs> what's your favorite body part? Oh, it's, that's such a tricky one. And to be honest, I I should hmm, I should have thought more about this because there's so many good body parts. But I think maybe because we've been, you know, just talking about playing the orchestra, I play the flute. Um, and one of the body parts that is used so much in playing the flute is the tongue. So I maybe I'll pick the tongue because it's actually such a, I mean, obviously I feel like maybe I should have picked part of the brain, but, but the tongue is so cool because it, it can do so many things. We don't think about our tongue as much as we, as much as we use it, right? The things that it can do in our, you know, speech and then in music, in music where I'm using my tongue so much to play the flute and it does very interesting things. That is a first, I think, for us to have the tongue as the favorite body part. <laughs> and I it's love it. No, it's not. It's like one of the unsung heroes of our body, right? As you said, it is critical in language communication, taste, sensory experiences. We should all really have a moment of appreciation for the tongue. I right. like and if you think about like the representation of the tongue, like in the motor and sensory parts of the brain, there's a great big chunk of the brain dedicated to the tongue. And yeah, an un unsung hero. I like that. So with the tongue as your favorite body part, what's your least favorite body part? Oh, dear. You're really trying to be this one. <laughs> well, I'm trying <laughs> Um, I, I find as I get older, there's certain parts of my body that hurt a lot more than they used to. So I'm going to go with like the intervertebral discs as a, a body part that I really dislike. Like it's poorly designed. I agree. I wish yeah. mine did a better job. Um, so no, that's absolutely. where I am. Yeah, no, intervertebral discs, yeah. they're like the notochord didn't know where to go. So it ended up there and didn't make the best of it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I think um, so, all older listeners to the podcast are like, yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, like um, cartilage in general is like, who designed that? You know, <laughs> like, why is all my cartilage breaking down? <laughs> and I hope the younger audience is not, they're not rolling their eyes and say, oh, no. <laughs> oh, they, it's coming for them, don't okay. worry. That's right. They just have to wait another 20 years. <laughs> Well, Tara, thank you so much. Um, and, you know, uh, this has been a fascinating discussion. And, um, you know, I just um, on a personal note that you were, you know, you're just one of our students uh, at, at UBC. And now you are the, out there doing all these wonderful, great things. Uh, just a moment of pride for, for me personally. So, so thank you for all the work you do, Tara. Yeah. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, Tara, this has been such a pleasure. I share Shagan's pride. Um, this is, it's really wonderful to see our students go and and fly and do all the wonderful work that they do. And um, well, I know we'll keep in touch about music in the brain and I'm going to go and put some music on now. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. And that concludes this episode of Body Banter. Take care, everyone. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time.